Uh, now my haere mai, kia ora mai tato. Greetings. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, 25th Auckland Conversation in uh, 2013. It's an astonishing record, and I, I think we deserve a round of applause for Susan Quinn and Debbie who organised it. <laughs> we always saw this as a sort of a way of creating an intellectual ferment in Auckland and about how we could uh, become the world's most livable city and that we'd seek to attract uh, international class um, speakers uh, uh, such as uh, Sir Peter Gluckman as we have uh, tonight. So, and it's great to have you all here and I know it's just before Christmas so um, it's great to see such a good, uh, good turnout. But before we get to the business in hand we, we must deal with a very important uh, matter of giving our deep felt thanks to our sponsors. Uh, so if I could acknowledge our, our sponsors um, that make all this possible, uh, uh, Resine Paints, uh, ADNZ Architects and Designers uh, New Zealand, uh, and our program supporters uh, which include uh, Patterson's Architects, uh, GIB, uh, Boffer Miskell, uh, Landscape Architects and Brookfield's Lawyers. So could we give them a big round of applause? Thank you. Uh, now, just, just to, um, to open tonight's um, uh, conversation, uh, you'll be aware that um, uh, Sir Peter Gluckman re released a report uh, intended to update the public on the current scientific understandings of climate change and ocean, ocean acidification. And in particular, it focuses on how these changes are likely to affect New, Zealand, New Zealand's climate and industries uh, at a regional level over coming years. And the report highlights the changes that have been observed within New Zealand to date, uh, the probable impacts over the next 40 years, and the importance of ongoing monitoring. And it identifies that the regional impacts will be quite variable, and that it's important to look at seasonal patterns and the degree and frequency of extreme events rather than simply at average changes. Now, before I introduce uh, Sir Peter, I'd just like to um, give you a, a brief um, update on a very related project which uh, we are, are now doing called the uh, Sea Change Project, uh, as you see up on the screen there. This is our, our project name for uh, the Hauraki Gulf uh, Marine Spatial Plan. Uh, and um, this uh, really is about the Hauraki Gulf, or uh, Te Kapa Moana Te Maunanui Atoi, uh, which uh, has been valued by people ever since the first waka uh, navigated uh, its waters many centuries ago. And, uh, but, however, many indicators have shown that the Haraki Gulf is an ecosystem under real pressure, and that's been documented in successive State of Our Gulf reports uh, by the Haraki Gulf uh, Forum. And Tim Hyam is, uh, has been leading that, that work, and the chair of the forum is John Tr Trigger. So, uh, we have. Um, uh, pulled together uh, the sea change uh, project. The, the aim is to manage the pressures on the Gulf uh, and it's traditionally been very difficult because there are so many different agencies with an interest in the Gulf it's been quite hard to get a coherent management um, uh, plan that covers all the various conservation and, and economic and social and cultural interests. But now I'm pleased to say we have um, brought together through a partnership involving uh, Mana Whenua uh, covering the 26 iwi uh, in the area of the, the Gulf or the catch from the drains into the Gulf, the Auckland Council, the Waikato Regional Council, the Territorial Authorities, the Department of Conservation, the Ministry for Primary Industries and the Hiraki Gulf Forum all have come together uh, and will be working with a wide range of stakeholders. So we're using a collaborative process much like the Land and Water Forum uh, process. So the, the independent chair is uh, Nick Main, who many of you know, a former chair of Deloitte's. And he's the independent chair who's going to uh, facilitate the uh, stakeholder uh, working group. Uh, and just um, a bit about you, I'll just show you some of the, the slides. Um, uh, uh, here we are. Uh, so there's some of the, sorry, the agencies involved uh, in, the, uh, in the marine spatial plan process. Uh, the area covers um, uh, the area in the dark blue there, which is within both the, the areas covered, uh, the marine areas, uh, which are the responsibility of uh, the Auckland Council, and the marine areas, which are the responsibility of the Waikato Regional Council. 
and that covers the whole uh, Haraki Golf Maritime Park area. Uh, and because it's all one entity, uh, Auckland Council and Waikato Regional Council decided right at the start of the, the new super city that we would work together uh, on the Haraki Golf uh, Marine Spatial Plan. And of course, um, uh, there are many and varied uh, interests and uh, strongly held values associated with the golf. And just to illustrate um, some of these, uh, it's of course um, very important for its uh, conservation and ecological uh, values. It's very important uh, as a uh, recreational boating, recreational fishing uh, place. Um, it's a place for aquaculture and sustainable uh, fisheries. It's a place for a lot of recreational enjoyment. It's a place where you get coastal um, commercial shipping and, uh, and a whole lot of uh, uses. And the, the issue really is how do we make sure that we can um, preserve and enhance the uh, ecological health of the Gulf over, over coming years and generations and at the same time uh, make sure that the Gulf's uh, resources can be used for sustainable uses uh, such as aquaculture and fishing and tourism and uh, recreational activities. So there's some of the uh, commercial fishing that we uh, see using the Gulf. The issue of uh, protection of British whale is obviously is, is an important uh, uh, issue. Uh, the aquaculture industry, there's been a moratorium on aquaculture development over recent years and largely because of the lack of an ability to get an agreed approach uh, which recognised both the commercial and uh, economic interests as well as the um, conservation interests. Uh, it is of course a beautiful natural environment uh, which uh, we of course want to protect and enhance. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the, uh, the shot there looking out over the, uh, the Gulf uh, towards Rangitoto Island. So we began with the Auckland Plan. Uh, the Auckland Plan includes green fields and brown fields and now blue fields. So uh, that's um, just a bit of a background to the, um, the Hauraki Gulf Marine Spatial Plan, which I, I think is very relevant to Sir Peter's talk. If I could now introduce um, Sir Peter Gluckman, was the founding director of the Liggins Institute and is one of New Zealand's uh, best known scientists. His research has won him numerous awards and international recognition, including a fellowship of the Commonwealth's most prestigious scientific organization, the Royal Society of London. Uh, he is the only uh, New Zealander elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science USA and the Academy of Medical Sciences of Great Britain. In 2009 he became a Knight of the New Zealand Order of Merit, replacing the 2008 Distinguished Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to medicine and having previously been made a Companion of the Order in 1997. In 2001 he received New Zealand's Top Science Award, the Rutherford Medal, in July 2009, he was appointed as the first Chief Science Advisor to the Prime Minister of New Zealand. And he has had an enormously influential role uh, uh, since then. He gave an inspirational address to one of these Auckland Conversations a year ago about the importance of science and economic uh, development in New Zealand. Uh, he's an international advocate uh, for science, promoting the translation of discoveries in biomedical science into improvements in long-term health outcomes. He is the author of over 500 scientific papers uh, and reviews and editor of eight books, including three influential textbooks on, in his subject area, and he's even had time to join us tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Peter Gluckman. Thanks, Roger. If I sound a little bit discombobulated, so far today I've had to deal with you, suicide. I've had to deal with uh, funding streams for science, and I've had to deal with issues in medical research, and now I have to talk about climate change. So, and I've just flown up from Wellington, the traffic between the airport and downtown was awful, Roger. Uh, uh, uh. Now, the problem I have is I'm not an expert in science on climate change. My job is not to be an expert on everything a science advisor to a government cannot be. Rather, my role is to reach out to be a knowledge broker. That is to reach out to the scientific community, to find where the expertise lies, evaluate it on behalf of the Prime Minister, to identify what we know and what we don't know, 
and then to, understand, to ensure that the knowledge we have and the limits around it are appropriately communicated and understood. Now, when it comes to climate change, climate science has been made out to be controversial. Wrongly, in my judgment, it's led people to think it's a poor and second-rate form of science. And that's definitely not the case. The science is very good science, and its implications are very clear. And because of these misconceptions, I want to spend the first few minutes of this talk talking about the nature of science and how science deals with probabilities and uncertainties, because I think the media has not helped us in this story by trying to present this as some sort of scientific debate where, there are, where it has to be weighed up on either side. And I'll come, and, and I'll get, I'll come to the origins of that debate in a moment. But I think we need to get beyond that pseudo-debate, because I think the time has passed. And we need to start thinking in risk management terms at both the global, national and local level. All said and done, if you were told that your house had a very high likelihood of burning down in the next 20 years, you'd do something about it. You'd certainly take out insurance. You'd probably invest in fireproofing the house to the extent that you could. And the only thing you'd probably take into account is whether you're being told that the likelihood of the house burning down was coming from an expert who understood about fires or whether you're relying on a fortune teller. And if you think about it, we do the same thing with earthquakes. We invest heavily as a country in protecting against earthquakes because the modelling tells us that there's a high likelihood of earthquakes happening in the next period of time and we take a number of costs, both personally and as at the state level, because of that. We don't ignore the risk of earthquake just because somebody says, ah, it won't happen in the next 50 or 100 years. We take the role of the experts into account that, uh, that there's a high probability of it occurring. And climate science is no different, absolutely no different to those, to, to those two scenarios. Science is not a set of facts. It's a set of, of established processes by which we come to develop reasonably reliable information about our natural built and social worlds. And inherent in that process is, a, is the principle of organised scepticism, which leads scientists to test and retest their ideas and to challenge each other until some reasonable conclusions are reached. If you discount dogma and belief, we have no other processes by which to base our understanding of the world. Because in recent years the processes of computation in particular have developed dramatically, we're now able to deal with much more complex science than we used to be able to. Until the Second World War, we were really limited to using science to deal with rather simple systems looking for direct cause or effect. But because science now can deal with complex systems, we can address issues like climate change, like ecological systems, which are characterised by very many interactive, complex, uh, nonlinear feedback loops. The other thing about climate is we can't experiment. We only have one planet. We can't experiment. So it's not an experimental science like much of medicine. Rather, it's like much of geology and evolutionary biology and that it's based on a series of retrospective analysis of retrospective data and current data, allowing us to build models and then extrapolate forward. Obviously, those models become increasingly complex the more knowledge we have about these various inter complex interrelationships. But because models are by definition based on the analysis of the past and the present, data about the future must be presented as probabilities. Indeed, for any complex system, we have to talk in probabilities. Let me give you a simple, a simple but obvious example. Think of the treatment for, of a cancer or a disease. Some people respond better to a chemotherapy, to a form, one form of therapy, than others. But we don't know until we try it whether you're going to be one of the people who does respond or doesn't respond to this treatment or to that treatment. 
And that's why a doctor has to present, well, this, this treatment has this probability of working, or that treatment has that, form of, uh, that probability of working. That, just because doctors are talking in that situation in probabilistic terms doesn't make the science of drug treatment any less valid than any other form of science. Equally, because we have to talk in probabilistic terms in climate science doesn't make it any less valid. The other feature about climate science, and here I'm getting towards a punchline, uh, is like many other areas of science, it's dealing with issues where there's a strong values component. The, the, because the implications of the science involves political decisions at both national, international and regional levels, with many societal consequences, there's obviously a very high values component. Science tries very hard to keep values out of what it does, but of course science in itself is never absolutely values free. The one values component that's highly relevant in this area, when we're dealing with great complexity in science, is the issue of sufficiency of evidence. When is there sufficient evidence in a complex system with many unknowns on which to draw conclusions on which policy makers and others should act? There's an inferential gap by definition between what is known, because we cannot ever know everything. All said and done, we will not know what the temperature of the planet will be in, 20, in 2100 until 2101. Uh, we have to, there is an inferential gap between what is known and what we would like and the conclusions we draw. Because this is an area of, in an area such as climate change, the issue of this inferential gap and the sufficiency of evidence is so important, we have developed a special process, which is the IPCC process, I'll talk about in a moment, to try and deal with this gap. But the biggest values component which has led to some of the so-called debate in climate change lies with the public and the policymaker, not with the scientists. For climate science implies decisions have to be made, and those decisions involve trade-offs. The biggest single trade-off is one of intergenerational equity. Does this generation have to incur economic costs, not because there'll be a direct benefit necessary for this generation, but to protect the planet for the next generation, or can this generation continue as it is hoping that technology will solve the problem in another generation's time or the problem will go away anyhow. And so it's this issue of the costs and where the costs lie in either mitigation or, or adaptation for probable events of, un, of somewhat uncertain magnitude in the future that causes all this confrontation. These decisions involve costs and potentially impacts on many industries, whichever way they are made. And, is that, and the values debate has come over to dominate in some people's mind over the science and obscure reality. But values debates are uncomfortable. They always are. Particularly New Zealand is not very good at having these kinds of debates. And it's much easier for protagonists on either side of a debate such as this to use science as a proxy and therefore magnify the inherent un scientific uncertainties and debate the science itself when there's actually little to debate beyond the technical data, detail that generally has no implication for policy settings. And we've seen science increasingly being used as a proxy for values debate time after time. We saw it early on in the 1970s over smoking bans. Was tobacco really harmful or not? We've seen it recently in the fluoride debate, where it's issues of individual freedom, not issues of fluoride safety that are in the debate. We've seen it over the debate over genetically modified foods and so forth. There's one further general matter I'd like to raise, and that's the issue of perceptions of risk. Risk means different things to different people. Scientists tend to think in probabilistic terms. One in a thousand, one in two thousand, etc., etc., etc. 
the individual thinks about risk in a much more visceral way, in a much more emotive way, and has a more subjective view of what risk means. And of course, the politician sees risk in a totally different way, largely in terms of electoral cycles. It, it's real. And how individuals perceive risk is a large topic in itself, but some points are worth making because we need to understand that if we're to address climate change as a society, we have to take a risk management approach to it. Rational estimates of risk are, are often influenced, are generally sublimated to these more emotional estimates of risk. And all of us are influenced in our emotional assessment of risk, myself included, by lots of inherent biases we have. We tend to overestimate the likelihood of rare events and underestimate common events. We have a greater tolerance for risk if we think we will benefit, and we have less tolerance for risk if we think others will benefit. A key issue in all these issues around risk becomes the issue of trust in the regulators, and you can think of government, in a sense, as a form of regulator, in the sense, uh, who are assessing risk and acting on risk on our behalf. We think the Civil Aviation Authority is a trusted regulator, so we're all reasonably happy to get on an aeroplane and rely on the fact that the, the regulator has dealt with all the risk issues associated with flying, and we're likely to get to the other end safely. We accept them acting on our behalf. We used to be very certain about, say, a food safety regulator. We're perhaps less certain now since the foot and mouth, since the mad cow epidemic in the United Kingdom, the salmonella e episode with eggs, and so forth. And indeed, what we've seen is because of the GM debate, which is not about food safety, but was about other, uh, other aspects, um, we've seen an undermining of risk of confidence going on in food safety regulation around the world. When we come to climate change, we have to rely on governments and local bodies to make decisions on our behalf. And these issues are getting harder to deal with. The rise of the internet around, allows highly sophisticated but sometimes very biased opinion positions which appear credible on any and every issue. It gets very hard to navigate one's way through such contested positions on the net unless one's truly an expert. But the very processes we have just talked about make trust in experts and in knowledge brokers harder to sustain. Now that's been a long introduction, but I think I need to make it because we still have in Auckland ongoing debates, if you listen to News Auk ZB, who I'm sure will accuse me of being the devil incarnate but at, at 8.45 tomorrow morning. Uh, um, he always does, uh, whenever I mention climate change. Uh, we need to understand these issues are playing out in our own country. The underlying issue we face is the global rise in population, and it's a, which it really took off in the last century, and it's associated demand for higher standards of living, economic growth, food, energy and water security and the impacts of these greater demands and expectations on the planet. And this equation creates all sorts of policy dilemmas of how to provide greater standards of living, energy, water and food security to peoples who have a de desperate right around the world to better standards of living, while on the other hand preserving the planet. After all, the world's population is going to grow by at least another 40 per cent, and many of those people have the justified rights to much higher levels of standard of living than they now have now, and those standards of living will require greater use of energy and resource extraction. Managing this dilemma at both a global and local level is not easy for the very reasons I've talked about, and these issues are at the very heart of our own national dilemmas. Think of balancing dairy intensification against water quality, or the use of new technologies for food production, or how we think about extractive industries such as mining and, and offshore drilling. Anthropogenic climate change, in a sense, brings all these issues together and into collision with no easy answers. Now, let's turn to some slides. <clears throat> 
Am I moving the wrong one? We'll try the other way. Yeah. Recently, I released this report. It's on the web, as seen below. Uh, and that report started because every year I write a, I, the Prime Minister asks me for a brief update on what the current state on climate change is. And I talk to a few of the experts we have in this country, and I've usually just given them a fairly brief update about what we think about ocean levels, t CO2 levels, temperature rises. And I realised that was not enough. I realised that we've been talking about what is seen at the global level in terms of averages. And what a government really needs, and what the population really needs, is an analysis of what will happen in New Zealand at a regional level, and a level to actually get the various sectors of the community to start thinking about what needs to be done. And so, with the help of Kate Harlan from my office, who's somewhere in the room, we got a large number of experts in New Zealand from Crown Research Institutes, universities, and from government departments together and had them both interrogate, and we interrogated them and had them interrogating each other and the report we wrote until we reached this report, which has four purposes. Firstly, to sketch out the main uh, conclusions of the climate science uh, community as to what will happen, not in a hundred years' time, but what's likely to happen in the next generation, in our children's lifetime. Secondly, to highlight the difference between talking about average changes in temperature, all said and done, a rise of temperature of one to two degrees doesn't sound like very much, but what happens at the extremes is what we need to think about, and I'll come to that in the body of this talk. Thirdly, to talk about what happens in New Zealand, and fourthly, to think a bit about how New Zealand should respond to what's likely to happen over the next few years. I'm not gonna spend much time debating anthropogenic climate change, because I don't think it's a debate we need to have. We're now at the point where we have to address its consequences. The fundamental uh, science behind climate change is now well known that gases like carbon dioxide, it's not the only one, trap the heat from the sun underneath it and warm the atmosphere at the low level, warm, the, warm terrestrial surface, and warm the oceans, and we'll talk a lot about that as we go on. We know that the year on year, and this is the temperature changes here, you can see on the bottom left-hand panel, recorded at uh, the CO2 changes, carbon dioxide changes, recorded at Wellington Harbour entrance over the last, uh, from 1973 onwards. And you can see it's risen from a level of 320 which was not much higher than what it was in the pre-industrial era of about 280, to now three, over 390. And you can see it's been going up year on year on year since that time. Hawaii reached what is the magical cutoff number of 400 uh, parts per million of carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide earlier this year. We can measure lots of things about New Zealand. We can show, as on the top left-hand slide here, that our temperatures have been rising from 1910 reasonably progressively, with variation, and we'll talk about variation in a moment, to now. We've seen that since 1900 to, two, to, to now, the sea level has gradually risen. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's risen actually by about 15 centimetres uh, over that 100 years. It's not, uh, the sea level temperature has risen around New Zealand, as shown on the bottom left-hand side. And on the right, you can see that the ocean is acidifying progressively, it goes up and down for seasonal reasons every year, and you can see that it's rising rapidly. So New Zealand is doing what the rest of the world is doing. It's warming, it's facing sea level rise, it's, right, it's facing sea temperature changes, and it's facing acidification of the ocean. Just because we're isla an island, we're not being protected. Now, it's certainly the case that other things affect our temperature. We know that there are ocean cycles, that there are many natural cycles that affect us. We know that the Earth's orbit affects uh, uh, the global te the, the temperature. We know the sunspot cycles affect global temperature. 
We know that the El Nino cycle affects uh, our, our temperature. We know that large volcanic eruptions can lead to some temporary cooling of the planet. And we can take all those things into account in our models. But when all said and done, we can't get away from the fact that the temperature is warming and this is associated with a rise in CO2. Now there's been a lot of attempt, and also the other point to make is the changes in our temperature and, and the CO2 cannot, are too rapid to be explained by a number of the, of the slower kinds of environmental changes that lead to the ice ages and those kinds of things which have happened in the past. Now, some people have highlighted the so-called pause in warming over the last few years. And I need to point out a few key points. The first is that in the last 17 of the, la of the last, the 17 of the most warmest years on record have occurred in the last 25 years. Secondly, the difference between weather and climate is essentially how you look at it on a time base. We look over weather over short time bases. We look at climate over long time bases. And if we use longer time bases, these transient changes which are due to things like volcanoes and sunspots level out. And in fact, probably the biggest reason for this relative decline in the rate of terrestrial climate change, warming has been the sunspot cycle. The sunspot cycle over the last few years has been le leading to a relative reduction over the last 10 or so years in the amount of thermal energy coming from the sun. That cycle is now coming to an end and, we, and it will change again. But despite the fact that there's been less thermal energy, CO2 levels and in fact global temperatures have been rising, just not as fast as they do when you look over a longer time base. Of course, other forms of natural variation, like a change in the solar uh, 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 production of, of heat, will lead at times to exaggerated directions in the other direction. Now, there's a deeper issue. CO2 rises, but there's a difference in how CO2 might affect temperature in the land and in the oceans and what happens in the oceans. In fact, where we look, temperature is just a form of, of energy. And so we've got to think where that energy goes. Some of it goes into the atmosphere, and so we record that as warming, or, or, as warming of the temperatures we feel on the surface. But if you look at this graph, by far the bulk of the energy that's been produced, uh, which is associated with global, with, with, with global warming, has not gone into the, ocean, into the land and on the, temp uh, and, and on the surface of our atmosphere. The other little bottom bits at the bottom of this graph the two blues show that the, by far the bulk of the energy has ended up in the oceans. And what we're seeing is warming of both the superficial ocean and more recently unequivocally warming of the deep ocean. And because water and land have different thermal capacities, they will, there will be times at which we will see disconnects between the rises of CO2 and changes in land temperatures. This just explains these complex relationships between CO2 and what it does in different systems in the land and in the ocean. And I think in the interest of time, I won't go into it, other than to point out the obvious thing, that when carbon dioxide rises in the atmosphere, it also infuses and gets absorbed by water. And when carbon dioxide gets absorbed by water, it acidifies, it causes acid, carbonic acid. And we've seen a change, and I showed you on the slide earlier, a progressive change in the acidification of water around New Zealand in the last recent decades. It's also important to note that while I've been talking about carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. But for scientific reasons, what we do is we convert the warming effect or the heat trapping effect, I should say, of other forms of gases to carbon dioxide equivalents so that we can have a way of talking about it. It's just a, a, a scientific trick. We've all got to use the same units. In fact, methane, which our cows and sheep produce and rice paddies produce, uh, 
and other forms of rotting pet vegetation also produce is actually a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide, about 25 times more potent. Its life cycle in the atmosphere and the system is much shorter than carbon dioxide. It lasts for decades, where carbon dioxide is effectively lasting for centuries. And that's why there's been a lot of interest in, in reducing carb methane production as a way of uh, reducing, um, quickly adapting to climate change. It's not as easy as people think, because a large amount of it is actually from rotting vegetation and so forth. And also there's a great concern about what Arctic warming might do to tundral production of methane over time. Without going into all these areas, I think it's sufficient to say that the consensus amongst the, cli the climate change community is very clear. That is that there's high confidence in the fact that anthropogenic or global warming caused by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is changing the way in which this planet operates. So what lies ahead for New Zealand? Because we're surrounded by oceans, New Zealand may experience a slight lag in mean temperature change compared with the global change over the medium term. But, as, but in the future, as elsewhere, unusually hot weather can be expected to occur much more frequently and we'll expect new records for temperature highs. For example, Auckland currently experiences about 21 days per year with a temperature over 25 degrees. Celsius. This figure is thought that it could well reach 60 or more days per year by 2100, even under a low emission scenario. That is, assuming that the world manages to reduce its emissions and so we have a lower trajectory into the future, according to NIWA's climate modelling. One of the problems in all this area is the biggest unknown about the future is actually what happens to human responses, whether we reduce our emissions as a, as a planet, I'll come back to that in a moment, or not effectively. Clearly, if there is not much of a, a planetary response to reduce emissions, the predicted temperature rise will be much greater than if the, the global community manages to agree on how to reduce emissions in the near future. As you all know, New Zealand already experiences regional variation in, in its rainfall due to its geography. And as wind and circulation patterns alter as temperature changes in the sea occur, climate change will change rainfall patterns considerably. These will vary considerably over different pa parts of the, of, of, of the country. In general, the west coast tends to be wetter, as you can see in these blue areas. And Auckland, North Auckland and east, east Coast become much drier. But that's just looking at average changes in rainfall. Of greater concern and of greater economic concern is going to be when the rainfall occurs. If you think about our economy, it's very linked when rainfall occurs to the grass growth cycle, therefore to the dairy and sheep production industry on one hand, and to the and to the hydro station energy power production on the other hand. And what we're going to see is a big shift, or quite a big shift, in the patterns of when rainfall occurs. So it's not just a matter that there's going to be a 10% a reduction in, in rainfall which happens here, and a 15% increase in rainfall which happens here. It's when it occurs and how it occurs which will have enormous impacts on our economy. For example, we're going to see relatively less springfall rain and summer rain in these sorts of areas. And if you're a dairy farmer or a sheep farmer, that's going to have enormous consequences. Equally, while we rely on spring and summer rain and part of our hydro generation, there'll be issues there that occur earlier. I could go on and on. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But just as the rainfall will change, we'll have more rain that occurs in heavy episodes, the kind of a cyclone, tropical downpours, which is not easy because you can't trap that water and manage that water in the same ways, and has other consequences like floods and so forth. But at the other end, we'll also face more drought. 
We thought that by the mid-century, there'll be two or more extra weeks of drought per year in, 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 the, in the, much of the North Island and in the East and South Island. And you can imagine what that would do in terms of our pastoral economy. It's not, it sounds not like much to a Queen Street uh, denizen, but if you're a farmer out there in the Hawke's Bay or up north, believe you me, an extra two or three weeks of drought has enormous consequences on our industry. I'll discuss in a moment some of the other consequences that occur. Now, I just want to deviate back, I don't know if I can remember how to work this thing, and just go back to the IPCC, because I think people misunderstand what the IPC process is about. The IPCC process, international, uh, 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 the IPC process is about the scientists agreeing on what we know and what we don't know and the significance of the gap, inferential gap, between what we know and the conclusions that have to be born together. It's a remarkable process. It brings thousands of scientists together. And because the last stage of the process involves a government policy consensus, it's inherently a more conservative process than what the scientists might otherwise be saying. It's very heavily peer-reviewed. Yes, by definition, there's thousands of articles studied uh, and, and summarised, and the odd mistake which some people have magnified will creep into some reports. But the reports are subject to extensive peer review and it really is a very good summary of what we know and what we don't know. But as I said, because the reports by their very nature tend to be more conservative than what the scientific community itself might think, sometimes they've been, there's been criticisms that the IPC process can lull policymakers into a false sense of security. But I won't go into that any further. It's the best process we have. And I think what you can see here is just extractions from its report, and you can see the enormous rise in mean global surface temperatures, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, but you can see it also applies in the Southern Hemisphere as well, which has occurred since pre-industrial times. And the report is very much similar to the kinds of comments I've just been making. As I said earlier, Climate science involves probabilistic approaches. We have to project ahead the process. And there's really two kinds of uncertainties. And here, what you're seeing is the predicted rise in global temperature uh, uh, since pre-industrial times as the most likely scenario in the middle. But remember, most likely means average of a whole lot of estimates. And there are estimates which means it could be much greater or it could be much less. That's inherent in any probabilistic modelling. But what I want to point out is the uncertainty that's due to the science is shown in blue. You can see that we can predict out to 2100 and the global average temperature will be between 1.7, let's say, and about three temperate degrees higher than pre-industrial temperatures. But the total uncertainty is shown in green. And this uncertainty, which ranges from one degree to four degrees, relates to what will humans do. Will the global community be able to control emissions or not? If it could stop all emissions tomorrow, which is clearly not going to happen, then inevitably we'd still have some temperature rise, but we might be able to live with only a one degree temperature rise or thereabouts. If we can't control emissions at all well, then we're facing at least a four degree rise in temperature. And so the point I want to make is the biggest uncertainty in climate change, the biggest uncertainty is how the human, uh, the global community of humans responds to, what, to, the, to, the, to the situation. And so we're dealing here really with the situation of risk management. Are we prepared to, not to do anything, or do we have to say the risks associated with these sorts of changes are such that the global community has to deal with it? 
And as we've seen, this is a really complex issue. And the issue is complex for reasons that are very simple. Adaptation, that is responding to climate change, is a local matter. Each local body, each government on its own, can deal with adapting whatever it has to do to deal with sea level rises or changes in temperature. But dealing with stopping emissions is a global issue. It's not a local issue. And so you've got this imbalance in where the issues lie and have they held to be, how they have to be dealt with. And this is not easy, and I'll come back to that momentarily. Oh, what am I doing here? Too many buttons here. Now, the other point I want to make is up to now I've been talking largely in terms of averages. And, aver and the whole point of my report was to get away from averages and get people to think the average doesn't matter. It matters. But what really matters is averages are averages on what are oscillating or variable systems. And so you need to think about what's going to happen at the extremes of variation, because it's the extremes of variation that really matter. We all know that in everything we do. Uh, and so what I want to point out here, and this is, I don't want to be too mathematical, but when you shift the mean, if this is a curve of distribution of something like predicted temperature, about like seasonal temperatures, or temperatures on a given day, if you, you might only shift the mean by just a little bit to being warmer, but the amount of time we spend with extreme uncomfortable temperatures rises disproportionately high. You see the point I'm trying to make? Small shift in, in a mean in one direction, and this could be sea level, it can be temperature, it doesn't matter what it is. A small shift in the mean which may not sound very dramatic, a shift in, in sea level by 10 centimetres or something, or 10 millimetres. What happens in lands of the extremes of high tides may matter a lot more. And what we're seeing, you can do those calculations, is these subtle shifts in temperature are leading to, which is such as we've seen in New Zealand here in recent times, can lead to very big shifts in the extremes. And planners, national, regional and local, have to think in terms of what's going to happen at the extremes, because the extremes are what we have to manage for. Think of flood control. We have to manage for extremes. And this just shows what's happening. We're already seeing this. Look at the number of frosts that have been recorded per year at Ruakura and in Invercargill, and in, because it's frosts are extreme of low temperatures. We're seeing a reduction in the number of extremes of low temperature progressively occurring in New Zealand over time. And equally, without going into detail, uh, we could have equally shown you data what's happening at the hot end of the spectrum. The same things, as I've suggested, apply to rainfall and temperature. And, uh, and to, to rainfall, sea level, and wind. Let's just take the example of high tide. If there's a shift in mean high tide which is relatively small, the number of times the high tide will exceed the current high, mean high level, spring tide level here, we're only talking about a 0.18 metre rise in sea level, will lead to basically a negligible number, say 10% of high tides being over the high level, the mean high level mark, up to over half the high tides being above the mean high level mark. So you can see the point I'm making. If you're planning the causeway uh, from uh, Teatatu, you have to not think about the mean, you have to think about the number of extremes you have to get. If we face in a year's time in a half a metre sea level rise by, 20, by 2100, which is well on the cards with the current predictions, then every tide will exceed the mean high level tide we have now and by quite a lot. And you can see we have to plan realistically for tides for up to two metres, allowing for the fact that on top of that, if you have a low pressure system, which will make the water levels even higher, you have to start planning for much higher levels than perhaps the one and a half metres that I think we're planning for on the Teatatu Causeway at the present time. And so planners need to think at every level about the extremes. Now, 
beyond that, we can have many other effects, and I'm not going to go into them, but we should be thinking New Zealand prides itself on its biodiversity. All said and done, what's one of the things that make New Zealanders what we are is we value our flora, our flora and our fauna as something more than just something nice to have. It's inherent in being a New Zealander, irrespective of your political persuasion, that these things really matter. And climate change will change our biodiversity. For reasons that, if you understand evolutionary biology, would be obvious, our, our species that are native to New Zealand have adapted to certain climatic conditions which have existed over the last few thousand years. A rapid change in climate will put some at risk and make it much easier for species from exotic species that come from more uh, warmer climes or more uh, to, to develop in New Zealand. But there's more complex things. If flowering times change, and they will change as a result of changes in climate, then the whole ecosystems are built on flowers from the, bee, the native bees, the pollination, which then feeds into birds and other things change, and potential for changing quite a lot in terms of how our whole native ecosystems operate could occur. The other thing that will happen is there will be a change in the kinds of exotic insects and bugs and viruses that could impact on New Zealand, and, ex and we'll have to think again about what kind of biosecurity measures we will need to deal with some of these vectors. Now, let's turn to the real world, the world of the economy. Different parts of our society and different industrial sectors will have different abilities, different vulnerabilities, and also varying abilities to adapt. There will be some changes that actually will improve things in the short term if they're looked at in a narrow perspective. But we need to look over the longer term and over the broader, broader basis. Be, there's a danger that people will cherry pick to say, ah, there's an advant advantage because more CO2 leads plants to grow faster without thinking about the fact that on the other side, temperature change will change pollination rates, they'll change the survival rates of pests, they'll change other ecosystem services and so forth. Now, when one looks at the economy, and here I'm focusing at this stage on the primary sector, it's going to vary by sector, it's going to vary by region, it's going to vary by, by season. And, I can't, and the report tries to elucidate all of that. But if I just focus on the land-based industries first, because our economy depends so much on them, with rising temperature and CO2 levels, some plants will grow more quickly, provided there's sufficient nutrients and water. That might sound good. But there will also be other effects, such as on pest species, drought conditions, risks of heat stress to animals, changes in crop cycles, timing of seasonal events, which will probably counteract some of these effects, depending on the conditions. Farms will change or experience very different pasture growth rates and quality, and the impact on pasture growth is going to be very regionally specific, given these big changes in rainfall I talked about before. Overall, pasture growth rates are likely to grow faster in spring, which is not much help to farmers because they've already usually got excess grass in spring, but it's like to combine with low autumn and summer growth areas in the areas which have reduced rain, which is where far dairy farming in particular will be put at particular risk. There will also be a shift in what grasses grow. Remember, our whole economy is built on the ryegrass clover farming system. There will be a shift towards faster growing but lower energy performing uh, subtropical grasses like Kikuyu and away from the traditional ryegrass and clover pastures because of these changes. This will obviously counteract some of the good effects on pasture growth that come from CO2. And these lower energy grasses, such as kikuyu, will spread in their distribution. And there's been quite a lot of modelling done of dairy farm systems at a, a, a four representative areas in New Zealand. And the results suggest that if the practice of business as usual is followed, there will be mild to moderate productivity uh, and profitability losses under any climate change scenario ahead. 
with the implementation of some adaptation measures such as irrigation, there will be this change could be turned into a near-term increase in operating profit subject to the cost of irrigation. But as climate change goes on and gets more aggressive, these gains will be lost and then the impact of things like extreme effects, heat effects on cattle health will take over. Similarly, you could see the same thing happening in the forestry industry. But if we get beyond the fact that our pine trees might grow faster, fungal pathogens will be more likely under warmer uh, uh, climates. There will be severe impact on forests, risk of forest fires, and we think that there will actually be quite a lot of risks ahead. Because forest planning operates over much longer time frames than horticulture and farm management, because returns take many decades to occur, we need to start making planning decisions now about the changes in growth rates, fire hazards and biosecurity risks in planning how our forest plantations are developed and planned. We need to do research how to do that. Horticulture will change. Obviously, with warmer temperatures, there may be possible to grow crops which now grow only in the north of New Zealand, such as bananas, to move them further south and there'll be less frosts. But on the other hand, some of our crops, such as grapes, actually thrive when there's some level of cold temperature around. So there may be changes, in, in, in quite a lot of changes, in region to region in what, what can be grown farm, by, by our horticulturists. These are issues that will have to be looked at at a regional and a local level, and they're not trivial. Also, if we think about that, there'll be changes in flowering times, pollination events, and so there'll be a lot of other follow-on effects. The problem we've got in all of this is most of this work has been done assuming that there'll only be a shift in temperature of about two degrees. Of course, that assumes that we can manage what's ahead of us. If it's much warmer than that, the impacts may be a lot greater. Now, beyond our, our land-based primary industries, there's also going to be a lot of other effects, and I'll just mention them briefly. Fishing will change. We're already seeing more tropical species being caught in subtropical waters, and as, that, as ocean temperatures change further, that could lead to quite big changes in our fish supply. And also, because not all fish will be able to move, because of the, the local ecosystems under which they thrive, for instance, some are linked to coral reefs and so forth, we may see quite big disruptions in fish food chains. Beyond that, acidification has major effects on shellfish development. And acid, in an acid situation, shellfish, uh, the shells of shellfish become much thinner, and already there's concerns, and not in New Zealand, but in other parts of the world, such as in Oregon, over the thinning of the oyster shells and what that might mean for the robustness of their, of their industry. Ski industry. What happens if we see a rise in snow levels, which will happen? What happens if we see a change in the pattern of the snow melt? What does that do to our ski industry? What happens to our, our energy production if water supply comes and most of the rain falls at a time when we've already got full dams? These are kinds of things that we need to think about, and much of our planning needs to think about these issues. Beyond that, I think local bodies really need to think about coastal planning. I've already talked about sea level rise, but associate that also that there'll be an expected rise in the number of, if you like, subtropical cyclones, uh, of heavy low pressure events, which of course exaggerate sea level rise uh, quite considerably. That's what happened, of course, sadly, in the, in the Philippines recently. And so the storm surges associated with high levels, when sea level rises even a little bit, will be really important in planning coastal defences in terms of highways such as gorse ways and so forth. And I think that we need to think a lot more seriously and town planning 
needs to take some of these issues in terms of coastal defences, which take many years to plan and think about into account now rather than leave, letting it wait. I've raised in this talk the issues around climate change at several levels. I've, I, I could talk at length, but I won't because my report is on the line and I think that summarises the detail far better than I can in a rush talk. But as I've indicated, the biggest issue in climate change is how we respond to it. And there's two aspects to that. Mitigation, which is reducing the amount of, green, of, of warming by greenhouse gases, and adaptation. Now, I've not focused much on mitigation because for New Zealand, this is actually not a scientific issue. It's a values-based issue. The reason is that we only produce 0.2% of global emissions. The real challenge in emissions lies with the Indias, the Chinas, the United States, with Europe, and so forth. And so if, and as I said before, the problem of emissions is a global issue, how do we create, and the difficulties we've had with Kyoto and all these other things is how do we get an accord that gets all the big emitters to understand and agree what needs to be done and what are the reasons why they're objecting. So whatever we do locally will not change the global climate in terms of emissions. But this does not mean that we should not do anything. I, I've been misinterpreted in, the, in, in what I've just said. The issue is, however, one that's not for a scientist. It is, what does a small country do that might have political, diplomatic, moral circumstances in helping to ch advance the world's challenge of dealing with emissions? At the same time, there are economic costs. And this is the difficulty of any government, centre left, centre right, in how it addresses this issue. These issues are values-based issues. My judgment is no better than anybody else's in this room, and it's why I don't talk about it. I leave it for people to reflect upon. But the reality is, if you look at New Zealand, our overall emissions have grown quite a lot from 1990 to 2011. And the reasons that's occurred is because our agricultural sector has grown. 47% of our emissions come from agriculture. And, of course, we've got more cows than we used to have in our agriculture, and sadly we've got less forests than we used to have. The second thing is our transport sector has grown quite considerably, and 19% of our emissions come from uh, transport. What is New Zealand doing about it? Well, New Zealand actually has focused on this blue bit in quite a lot of effort. What New Zealand decided to do five years ago was to lead the world in trying to address this issue of agricultural emissions. We're the only advanced country in the world with half of its emissions coming from agriculture. Most countries, it's well below 20%. We look more like a developing world country in this pattern of emissions because we don't have much heavy industry uh, and so forth. And so the New Zealand government uh, engaged in setting up what's called the Global Research Alliance in Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, which was to look to develop research strategies to try and reduce agricultural emissions while at the same time maintaining food production. Because remember, for the world, food production and food security remains a, a, an acute and number one issue. We started with a few countries. We've now got 40 countries involved, including all the major emitters and all the major agricultural producers. The Secretariat is in Wellington. The first meeting was in Wellington. I co-chaired the first science meeting of this. And this group, which has led New Zealand, Canada, Netherlands, Argentina, United States, China, Japan, many developing countries as well, uh, much, of, much of Europe, is focused in four areas. How to reduce greenhouse gases associated with pastoral agriculture, how to reduce greenhouse gases associated with rice, because rice is an enormous producer of greenhouse gases. How to reduce greenhouse gases associated with the crop and arable, and how do we create farm systems that would, that would do it better. 
The research is complicated, but it's interesting that already there's good evidence that we should be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from ruminants while at the same time uh, increase it, maintaining food production. And the work is looking, which has led out the palms to North from Harry White and Harry Clark, is a remarkably interesting bit of work. New Zealand, this is the one area of research which New Zealand funds internationally. Little country New Zealand, special fund, is funding global research to try and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. We should be very proud of the leadership we've done there. If we just look at our emissions pattern a little bit further, I think this issue of road transport is something we need to really think about. We have the fourth highest production of road transport emissions per capita of any country in the OECD. It reflects our geography, but we need to start thinking more cleverly about how we might address these issues. I don't have the answers to do about how we do that, but it's something that we need to think about. For instance, our, it's much higher than, than many other countries that we would compare ourselves to. The other thing I want to point out is we do have some potential positives. Already we have a large amount of our electricity grid is based on renewable, particularly hydro and geothermal. And I think there's great potential, although hydro is at its limits, Geothermal, I don't think, is. Wind isn't, and clearly tide and current is there for the future. And I believe it's quite possible that 20 years from now, New Zealand could have an almost entirely renewable uh, uh, electricity generation sector, particularly as hydro allows us to deal with base load, which is an interest issue other countries don't deal with. On the other side, we have to look at this big change in land use. This land use issue is a concern because what we've done is we've actually reduced the amount of forest, land in forests, and that's deforestating. Now, I'm going to finish in a minute. What I've tried to do is point out what we think will happen in New Zealand over the next generation or so. Even the most optimistic of climate change policy makers do not think that we can obviate much of the, and the warming that is ahead of us, and indeed the inertia in the climate system of the planet is such that even with aggressive global mitigation, some level of adaptation will be needed. Now my point is we need to start planning that adaptation now. We've evolved a farming-based economy based on established patterns of grass growth which are going to change dramatically. We rely on water supplies which will change when and where they fall for many purposes, including agriculture and power generation. Land use will change. Our marine estate is changing. While there may be some uncertainty as to how much and when these changes will occur, the scientific consensus is strong. Any prudent risk management approach suggests that we need to plan our regional, national and sectoral strategies now. Many of these things that we need to do will take a long time base to develop and we need to start investing now, not just hope the problem will go away. For example, farming and land use strategies will take us a generation to change. Major water-related and land use processes, such as large-scale irrigation projects, take a long-term planning as anybody knowing about the RMA knows about. The science may be uncomfortable and somewhat uncertain in places, but it just can't be ignored. Thank you very much. Well, Sir Peter's just given us a tour de force on the science of climate change, so now you've got your chance to ask him uh, some questions. Um, uh, right, we'll get the microphone over, over here. And, and, um, uh, do you want the lights up a bit so we can see, you, see your eyes? <laughs> and, and could I ask you, um, uh, before you ask your question, could you just say who you are so we know where everyone's coming from? Over there. Um, my name's Adam, and I was just curious what the uh, Prime Minister's um, view is or response to your report. 
Uh, can we have a, a microphone for Sapita? about climate change being an issue. That's why he's invested heavily in greenhouse gas mitigation in agriculture. There is no debate, I've never had to debate the science of climate change with the Prime Minister. Nobody wants it, no policy maker wants it. It's creating some of the hardest policy situations you can think of because however it's handled creates issues which politicians have, have to confront at the electoral box. That's the difficulty. Okay, we have a question down here. Uh, yes, David Wilmot. Uh, Sir Peter, um, you seem to be proposing a sort of a national and global planning solution. I just wonder whether it, the alternative of a more market uh, option where farmers, knowing their own affordabilities, decide themselves how they change and the pace at which they change might not be a more affordable and less potentially destructive course than that of the central planning, which seems to have succeeded nowhere so far. Well, I'm not sure I'm advocating anything other than everybody at every level in the decision-making process, be it from the individual to the government, being conscious of what are the most likely scenarios ahead and having some view on how they have to manage for them. Now, while some things may be at the level of an individual farmer, it's not as easy as you think. Once you start thinking about having to change what kind of animal you might be growing, what kind of crop you might be growing, what kind of, when the milk supply comes in, whether you need irrigation systems, you're actually into quite complex thinking. Farmers are not all, it's a very complex set of issues which need to be grappled. It may be we will not be relying in 20 years' time on ryegrass and clover. Mm -hmm. We may be having to have quite different farming systems if we're going to supply, sustain the dairy industry. These are hard issues. Okay, I think we had a question. Uh, yes. Gary Taylor from the Environmental Defence Society. Thanks for your presentation, Peter, and for the report and for the leadership that you're showing uh, for the science community. I think it's... Uh, it's, a, it's an important role and I think you're doing it well. Um, I guess the problem that I have though <laughs> is that uh, we have, it's all very well to talk about adaptation and the end mitigation is where we need to go. Uh, and whilst it's one thing for a government to be relatively passive, as many governments are in respect of mitigation efforts, our government appears to be actively heading in completely the wrong direction in promoting coal mining, oil and gas exploration <laughs> and, and, and the kinds of things that would lead us towards a higher carbon future than we have now. And, and I'm just wondering, I mean I don't expect you to comment on the politics of it, but I wonder whether from your perspective you could see a need for a transition strategy for New Zealand so that we can actually map out over the medium term how we might in fact transition to a lower carbon economy as the UK has done with statutory provisions for that and with regular monitoring as they go along the way, whether you think that might be a useful uh, approach for us to take here. Well, I can, I'm sceptical of the UK thing, for example, 15% of UK energy is now wood chips coming from Canada and being shipped through the Panama Canal to Canada, uh, from Canada to uh, Britain, but it doesn't count. It's seen as renewable because it's wood. But, so there's all sorts of things in the UK model, that, uh, but that's another story. Um, I'm not going to comment on the politics of it because I think, but what I am going to comment on is just make a couple of comments as a commentator about the politics. And that is, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And governments are being confronted on one hand by demands for more economic, for more resources to be spread to the population for standards of living. And on the other hand, the fact that New Zealand effectively is an extractive economy based on farming, oil, 
and perhaps some minerals. And whether you're a centre-left or centre-right government, the electoral trade-offs are difficult. It's very difficult. And then on top of that, you, you have a whole lot of other things that come into play. I think the issue that New Zealand faces, and it's an issue that New Zealand faces in many other things as well, Gary, is we're a small country which can exert some leadership on the global stage in something. But in this particular situation of dealing with mitigation, with mitigation, the problem is the big players, China, India, the BRICS, uh, the other BRICS, uh, Europe and America cannot get a consensus. And it's difficult to see how New Zealand and Tim Grosser, I think, has tried quite hard as an individual to do so, you can get on a consensus on how to play this game. It's very difficult. Uh, so the politics, which I'm not an expert on, of, at the global level of climate change, may seem as if it's logical to us, but it's been played out against this, this expectation at the global level of certain countries thinking it's the West's fault that the emissions have got as high as they have because we have a certain high level of standard of living which has come off the back of industrialization and they're feeling they've got the right to get there. And this issue has not yet been resolved through Kyoto, through the post-Kyoto phase. And that is where the nub of the issue lies. Now, you're right that there's things that can be done at a local level and I think, but it requires a national consensus, and you're right, which gets beyond party politics, because party politics in the end gets caught up with economic redistribution in every election. And that's the difficulty. Okay. I haven't answered your question directly, because I think it's a, very, it, it, it's a very, very hard question, Gary, and I don't think anybody <laughs> knows how to answer it. <laughs> we wouldn't expect anything less from Gary, would we? Okay, over there. <laughs> uh, hi, um, my name's Mary Saul. I'm a marine biologist at the University of Auckland, one of your colleagues. Um, I would just like to comment about um, the comment you made about shellfish and ocean acidification. I was at a workshop last week um, where it was a US, New Zealand um, workshop on people who research on ocean acidification like I do. And we are going to have to grapple with that in the very near future, and particularly in the Firth of Thames, which is a large aquaculture growing area. And for you council people, this is something that's going to have to come up in your spatial yeah, plan. So. Because CO2, as well as coming from the atmosphere, is also coming from dairy runoff. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a conflict in this country as well in dealing with CO2 that's coming from our land-based ag agriculture, which is going to impact on the aquaculture industry. So, and the uh, Hauraki Gulf's got some particular upwelling issues that create a particular Yeah, so in risk. Oregon it's a slightly different yeah. situation because it's deep sea yeah. upwelling, but in New Zealand we're going to have problems with upwelling in the Marlborough Sounds and in the Hauraki Gulf, but we've also got a problem with dairy runoff. So we, mm -hmm. it is going to be something we're going to have to grapple with in the very near future. I don't disagree. Yeah. Next, okay, next, uh, oh, yes. Yes, good, good evening. My name's Francis, and I'm just an ordinary citizen. Um, I read in the Herald today the discovery of a new gas in the atmosphere, and I took the article out of the paper, and I believe it's been forwarded to you. Um, I hope you've had time to read it. Uh, are you surprised? No. I mean, we do know that a lot of industrial gases, and I can't remember what it's called, PBTX or something, which is a one of these industrial chemicals like uh, uh, um, we know and we know from the ozone story with the uh, fluorinated carbons and so forth that there are many industrial gases that get into the atmosphere and can do things uh, the fact that we fa they found another one which seems to be very potent as a at least at laboratory levels in trapping heat doesn't surprise me. What I don't know enough about, and, I'm, and it'll be too early in the story yet, is how important it is in terms of, of emissions and whether, it's inter and whether it's something that needs to be cold, controlled in the same way we did to deal with the ozone layer with the 
with the, with the Montreal Treaty. There's lots of things that are, are going to be found and discovered, but the reality is carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide are the big things we need to ro ro worry about and which we can do something about. Okay, question over there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Peter, my name is Graham, Graham Roberts. I'm a, I'm a planner and have been grappling with this issue for what and I on 30 years. Can I firstly congratulate you, your office and your researcher for probably the best technical summary I've ever, written, ever read in my entire career of a very complex body of science. Can I pose a couple of questions to you? Firstly, the World Bank and the ADB and a number of other multilateral lending institutions have adopted a policy of no regrets in relation to investment in climate change adaptation. Do you think that's a, a valid policy response? And my second question is, you highlighted one of the key reasons for success of the climate change science as the IPCC and its method of working. Does that forum and does that method of working and does that style offer us an alternative to the failure of Kyoto? Can we possibly get some consensus out of the IPCC that will lead us to something post-Kyoto? I can't really comment on the first because I've not really thought about it and I don't think I have any expertise that would really lend itself to it. In terms of the second, the IPCC is not a perfect process by any stretch of the imagination. The science bit of it goes well, but of course then there's a policy element on top of that which we commented on before. I think it's a process for dealing with scientific consensus. Is it a process for dealing with political consensus? No, I don't think so, unfortunately. Uh, I think the problem you have is is this going to be dealt with globally by a true global treaty of the kind that people would want? As you've seen, even with, look at the WTO negotiations. Look how difficult it's been over 19 years to deal with something as simple as making money. Uh, 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 the, 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 it's actually very complicated. There are people, some of whom are much more expert than I am, that think this will have to be done by a series of national level agreements that countries will have to, part of the problem being the US Senate of course and trying to get any international agreement ratified in the US Senate is going to be difficult. Um, so the issues of how this is dealt with are going to require a lot of leadership from the major leaders of the world to agree. Sadly, and this is a comment that's very personal, I suspect it will require a crisis before you, the consensus will be reached because I think at the end of the day, because there is a level of uncertainty and because people can look at things in different ways and because each government is responsive to its electorate or uh, in its own situation, it's going to be very difficult for some countries to move at the time when movement is needed. It's going to be very hard, very hard indeed. Uh, um, I just think it's, if you just think about how governments operate and deal and what they're responsive to, it's, these are very, very, we don't have a form of global governance that can deal with these issues easily. Time for two more questions. One over here. Um, Sayed Hami from Pacific Wind. Sir, so I would have liked to emphasize on two issues. One is the Kiwi ingenuity and innovations which are coming up uh, has been in the past and in the future will be a leadership in uh, uh, leading the rest of the world. So a small economy we may be, but effects are manifold. Second, the issue of renewable energy 100% renewable energy for New Zealand is uh, very likely within the next 10, 12 years. Uh, with the wind uh, technology, with the wind technology having reduced the point of conversion from top of the tower to the bottom, 
uh, has created a cheap electricity comparable with hydro. So that should be changing the shape of distribution in the future very fast. I hope so. I'm also, I also love to believe the first urban myth you created about our innovative capacities. The fact is New Zealand is not a particularly innovative country in terms of high value exports. We, uh, uh, we haven't demonstrated that we can turn that uh, value. We're very self-sufficient, which is our number eight wire mentality, but as yet we haven't managed to be. We have the lowest percentage of, our, of GDP as, as export. Lowest our exports are the lowest percentage of GDP of any small OECD country. The flyer about this particular uh, is available here for people to see if they want. Okay, thank you. Right, last question in the back there. Hi, I'm Grant, Grant Loney, uh, citizen. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Sir Peter. Possibly a slightly cynical question. One of the graphs you put up, I think, showed that the uh, total CO2 that New Zealand emits um, at the moment is around about 72 million tonnes per year of that order. Is that 0.2% of the world's emissions? 0.02, isn't it, Kate? I can't remember. So is it 0.2 or 0.02? 0.2, of course. Um, I guess my question, though, was given it's you know, around about, as you say, 0.2%, does it really matter much in terms of our climate whether we don't do anything much at all? It's such a tiny fraction of what's happening in the world. Point I was making: the reasons we engage in, in adaptation, sorry, in mitigation, are not about climate change directly ourselves. We will, New Zealand could cease all emissions it makes tomorrow; it would not significantly change the pattern of climate change over the future. But that's not a reason not to be engaged in mitigation. And the issues about mitigation are diplomatic, political. Uh, moral, I guess, would be the three areas to think about, philosophical. And we, New Zealand is a proud country in terms of being punching above its weight in the global community. We do so in so many other areas. The difficult dilemma for this government or the previous government or the next government is, is how does what New Zealand do in mitigation or how what it might do in mitigation play into the global, the need to get the big emitters to behave differently. That is the dilemma we have. And that is a really hard call on a government of any political ilk when there's economic cost, at least in the short term, associated with mitigation. That is the dilemma. It's not, and it's one I can't answer because I try to keep away from for, I, as a chief scientist, my role is to talk about the science. I can't answer, and, I, and it is a purely personal view that every person in this room will have to reflect upon what level, how could New Zealand, beyond just rhetoric, how could New Zealand influence what the big players do? Because it, it's the big players who will make the big difference to whether we're dealing with a a one degree, a two degree, a three degree, a four degree, or a five degree scenario. That's the, it's a really difficult question. If you want to spend three hours on it, go and see Tim Grosser. He will talk at length. And anybody who knows Tim, at length means really at length, on, on, the, on these issues at length. It's a really hard dilemma. And if you talk to the people who, in our foreign affairs and in our climate change negotiators, they will say this is the really hard dilemma, what, how should New Zealand approach it on the international stage? It's tough. Okay. Uh, we um, unfortunately have to bring this to a close. Um, so I'd just like to invite uh, Councillor Wayne Walker to come up and give a vote of thanks to Sir Peter. If I could just introduce Councillor Walker as the, uh, the chair of the Council's uh, Environment Committee. He's also chair of a uh, multi-stakeholder group that we have uh, developing our energy and climate change mitigation strategy. He's undoubtedly the sustainability champion of uh, Council, so please welcome Councillor Wayne Walker.
Can I ask you to put your hands together again for Sir Peter? This has been a magnificent presentation. I've read the presentation, the written form, I'm sure many of you have, but what we've seen in terms of the exposition, the pictures, diagrams, the localization, really hits us between the eyes. I certainly hope it's hit the government and the politicians between the eyes. I have enough trouble in Auckland Council with the politicians, so I've got no idea what it's like dealing with the people up the top. So this has been a great presentation. I think that there is a tremendous need for you to take the presentation that you've given us tonight, expand it out in both written and pictorial uh, form. We need video. This needs to go viral, frankly. It's that important. As far as I'm concerned as a councillor, this is the most important decision issue facing us. We use the word now on a number of occasions. It is now. So I just can't emphasize enough that this is up to all of us. We exert influence over the politicians. Frankly, there's an election next year. This needs to be gravitated up. It is a really important issue. So I think that there's a responsibility for all of us. I think you're providing us with excellent leadership, um, Sir Peter, and I really encourage you to take it uh, further. I know that you're responsible for a lot of things, but I think that this needs to be uh, right up there. So the more you can go on a tour exposing this, the better. So thank you again. Let's put our hands together again. And and I'll just give a quick plug, because where I come from is it's cities that make a difference, because much of humanity are in cities, and many of the cities around the planet, and Auckland is one of them, can make a difference. Next year, hopefully around March, Auckland's low carbon action plan will be re released. We can do it. We can reduce carbon emissions by 40 per cent based on 1990 levels by 2040. There are challenges, but it can be done. It's collaborative. And I would encourage all of you to get involved in that process because the process of implementing it is up to us. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much uh, for coming uh, tonight. Uh, have a great Christmas and, uh, and holiday. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. So we have the next events in 2014 up there. So we have exciting speakers like Greg Clark and Peter Newman. Have a great Christmas.